So uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, series seminar in the Center for Research on Language Diversity series. And I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, which is John Manfield from University of Melbourne. I actually know, we met John like nine, 10 years ago uh, when he was a student at ANU. Um, and I'm happy to say he's gone on to bigger and better things. First of all, at the DECRA, um, and now position at um, University of Melbourne. Um, so John is quite a prolific researcher and has done a lot of collaborative work with various people, which has resulted in a string of publications. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to him to talk about explaining morphosyntactic structure <laughs> interpredictability. Explaining morphosyntactic structure with interpredictability. Sorry, it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> My wife said she was almost going to come today because she could have just jumped in the car with me, but then she saw the title and she's like, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> so good on you guys for coming anyway, despite the title. <laughs> um, what is this all about? Let me try, just try and get things moving. Okay. So what I'm talking about is what are the explanations for like, Words and morphemes, what is morphosyntax? I mean, basically, you know, both morphology and syntax, and I'm not particularly distinguishing between them. They're all made up of like linguistic symbols, right? Morphemes or words, but they get arranged in particular ways, right? That's the whole study of, or much of the study of morphology and syntax. So the big question is, why do they end up arranged in those ways? And a very popular smash hit answer is that there's, just these underlying deep structures are uh, often considered to be universal, which therefore explains various commonalities we find among various languages. So that's quite a popular answer. But in more recent decades, there have instead been answers, which it's like, instead of there being a kind of underlying preset structure that's uh, explaining these sentences and words that we hear, instead there's, um, a range of cognitive and communicative processes that are sort of iteratively and gradually shaping these structures. And I'm very much working in this tradition here, and I'll be arguing a little bit against that tradition. And, but you know, you can say that seems like a good answer to us. It seems like some of us may think this is more kind of plausible and more easy to relate to other sciences and such. But then it leads to the question of, you know, how are you actually going to explain the structures? What are the actual mechanisms you're proposing? You don't want to be too uh, hand wavy about it. So to get less hand wavy about it, to really test it nicely, I'm going to actually try and uh, propose a specific actual like formal mechanism and even build it as a computer program to see whether it does what you hypothesize it's going to do. So what you get on a lot of in syntax, and I'm by no means a syntactician, but I'm just like flirting with syntax here. But you get, this is a, a slogan I've seen in a few places, structures, not strings. What they're getting at is, if you want to really understand syntax, don't just look at words in order like this, because what you really need to understand is the underlying hierarchical structures. So you can have the same order of words, a blue striped suit, but you could have two different underlying hierarchical structures. And the real syntax is these underlying hierarchical structures, not the, not the surface ordering of words, right? This is a popular approach in syntax. It really goes back largely to, well, it goes back to structuralists going back in the 1940s, but then Chomsky, Chomsky 1957, one of his main points was showing that uh, formal models of language pretty much require hierarchical structure to explain some things like relative clauses and embedded sentences and stuff. If you try and model it as sequences, it, it's just very inelegant and a bit implausible. Okay, so ever since Chomsky 1957, syntaxicians have been super keen on these like hierarchical structures and the surface string is like just, just a, you know, after effect, it's not the main thing you want to know about. But meanwhile, there's other bits of syntax and lots of bits of morphology where they are interested in just linear sequences of elements, either morphemes or words. And there are various linguistic phenomena that people have even claimed 
can only really be sensibly modeled as linear sequences. So that includes, you may be familiar with the concept of templatic morphology, like in polysynthetic languages, Navajo, so Northern Australian languages, and people who say, look, there's no sensible way to model this as a hierarchical structure. They're just kind of arbitrary <coughs> sequences of elements. Um, construction grammar, uh, I'd say is a mix of some hierarchical structure and some linear structure. There's definitely a fair bit of linear structure in there in these schemas that they propose in uh, construction grammar. And then actually within the kind of syntax tradition, not everybody uh, is as dedicated to the hierarchical structure as others. So I really enjoyed this book, Simpler Syntax. It's not super new, it's 2005, but it's one of the first kind of full syntax books I read where I didn't just like disagree with everything. Um, and part of it is uh, they propose that some element, is, it should really be called Simpler English Syntax, by the way. They, they, they propose that some parts of English syntax actually do seem to just be like linear sequences while other parts do seem to be hierarchical. So the overall approaches you've got, especially in syntax, are that hi these hierarchical structures are the really motivated, principled parts that proper syntax syntacticians should be interested in. And although some people do propose linear schemas, like in templatic morphology, they generally don't propose them as like principled things that have principled explanation. They more just say these are like, these are stipulative language specific sequences. And there's often not that much interest in kind of trying to explain why that particular sequence occurs rather than some other sequence. Okay, so these tend to be the two poles. That's all right. Yeah, I wanna move that. Do I put it, how about down there? That'd probably be less in the way. That's my emoji, yes, super important. And then even more important, I'm pro oh now it's blocking the other emoji. Oh, is that one? Yeah. Oh, beauty. All right. And but what we're actually doing in this study is we're doing the third option. We're going. We're proposing linear schemes rather than hierarchical structure, but we're proposing that they're principled and have uh, generalized explanations. They're not. Even, it's not even just language specific kind of accidents of history. We think there are principled explanations for linear sequences in language. And that's, we're not the first people to ever do that. So uh, for example, one well-known one is John Hawkins, who's got a series of books uh, proposing some aspect, looking at some aspects of syntax and the way that people sequence things and proposing cognitive principles for why people choose particular sequences. So if people wanna, people have the boat, and they want to combine this relative clause and this prepositional phrase, what they'll tend to do is they'll put the prepositional phrase first and the relative clause second. And the reason why they do it that way, the, the argument is that they want to minimize, they need to recognize the phrase structure and they want to minimize the number of words they need to get through to recognize that phrase structure. Oh, the politicians are going to jump on you for that. Or they can jump on John Hawkins, not me. Oh, that's pretty important. Oh, uh, and uh, if you break it up, you can do whatever you like. Break it up into exotic phrases. Sorry, I'm just talking about that one part. Sure. <laughs> All right. So Hawkins argues that this, well, and, you know, there's lots of experiments uh, showing that these structures are preferred over the ones where the little phrase is put at the end. And he claims that to do with trying to, it's to do with trying to minimize the number of words you need to get through to build your syntactic phrase structure. Okay, so we're not the first ones to use these kind of approaches. Um, and a nice thing about Hawkins's proposals is he, his starting points are variable linguistic production, which he argues shows kind of online processes people are using while they're pronouncing sentences or understanding sentences. But he then connects it up with the fixed structures shown in various languages from around the world. So for example, there are, strong patterns in languages of the world whereby uh, if you've got an ad positional phrase with a noun phrase inside it, if it comes after the verb, you want to use a preposition. If it comes before the verb, you want to use a postposition. And these orders are frequently found in grammars of the world. And these orders, the opposite ones, are very rarely found 
And that fits with the same explanation because again, it minimizes the number of words you need to get through to be able to understand the syntactic structure. So the point of the story is that what Hawkins was doing is uh, trying to look at processing explanations from how people you know, actually use language in real time and use those as explanations for some of the, grammat the fixed grammatical structures found in languages of the world. Okay, so we're in some ways following this kind of tradition in our study. And our study is, it's a case study of noun phrases, uh, but we're actually, we're trying to develop principles and a model which should be applicable to a range of structures in language. So here's a, you know, a hierarchical model of English noun phrase or parts of the English noun phrase. And when I last gave a version of this talk, one of the people's main questions were, could you talk through more why, why syntacticians even believe in this hierarchical model of the noun phrase? Because I'm going to argue against it. So I'll rather briefly mention some of the arguments for the hierarchical structure. Um, and maybe you'll understand why I didn't want to go into them before. <laughs> All right. So you get these anaphoric. Uh, from kind of tests people do, where it's to test, they want to work out what are the constituents, right? So this whole thing is a constituent, and this is a constituent, and this is a constituent, that's the kind of hierarchical model, right? How do we prove that that whole thing is a constituent, excluding that, et cetera, et cetera? People say one of the ways you can prove that is in anaphoric kind of back references. If you say, I bought three red hats and they gave me two more, the more part, is anaphorically pointing back to something earlier in the sentence. And the basic argument is whatever it's pointing at must be a syntactic constituent. And the idea is that more is the equivalent here of red hats. It means red hats, okay? So that must be a constituent. And if you then try to do it with, so according to this model, red and hats is, oh, sorry, not red, three and hats is not a constituent. You see that? According to the hierarchical model, there's not a constituent. So you shouldn't be able to point back at three hats. You shouldn't be able to say, I ordered three red hats, but then blue ones arrived where ones is understood to mean three hats. That would break the constituency test. Now, why I didn't even want to go into these things is to me, is, does ones anaphorically point back at three hats or not? I don't know. I don't know how people interpret that sentence. And I don't know, oh, I don't know immediately if people have done kind of specific psycholinguistic studies on it or anything. And even if they did a psycholinguistic study, I wouldn't find it such deeply satisfying evidence anyway. I'd probably say that's just probably to do with pragmatics and whatever was happening contextually. And actually, in that simpler syntax book, they go into these traditional constituency tests and they do tend to break, they, they believe that some of them break down pretty easily. So here's a long noun phrase, that silly picture of Robin from Mary that was on the table. And they claim that you can say that silly picture of Robin from Mary that was on the table and this one from Susan, where one can be understood to mean picture of Robin that was on the table as well. But this one's from Susan rather than from Mary. That's, they claim that that sentence can be understood in that way. Now, I don't even want to argue about whether it can be understood in that way or not. It probably can. You can understand anything in the right way, given the right context, right pragmatic context. But the point of the story is, again, it seems to, it muddies this kind of evidence. And my takeaway from this is the traditional, this is one of the main traditional syntactic constituency tests. You see them in syntax textbooks, often in early sections, and often they're kind of go through this as like, here's the 101, here's how we know what syntactic constituency is. Wasn't that nice? Now let's move on to the trees and work with them for the rest of the book. So I don't find them, I don't find them overwhelmingly convincing evidence. One refers to picture of Robin. Sorry, one refers to picture of Robin that was on the table. I should have highlighted oh, that as well. Oh, right, that refers yeah. to the whole thing. Yes. So it doesn't have to be, so it couldn't be on a chair. No, Robin yeah, yeah. On a chair, that yeah, one. yeah, they're saying it's another, picture of Robin that was on the table, but this one's from Susan rather than Mary. And sorry, I should explain it more. And the point is that that then supposedly refers back to a discontinuous oh, element right. that is not a constituent. Right. So they say this breaks the traditional constituency test. 
Okay, now all this was a bit of a tangent. I'm just kind of doing it by request from people who are at the other talk. <laughs> but if you want to know why people believe in the hierarchical model, this is these are actually parts of it. I personally just don't find these forms of evidence that strong, and I'm quite interested at how much of syntactic theory is based on these things. So I'm not an expert, so maybe I'm just misinterpreting the whole the whole literature. But there are other reasons, so that, which I also am not convinced by. Uh, people claim the semantic scope effect as well, that in this noun phrase like two black dogs, that two that black scopes over dogs and two scopes over black dogs. Um, so Rikoff claims that uh, he says, right, two must be scoping over black and dog together. Because when you say two black dogs, it can't be like the two must refer to must refer to the black dogs because you can't have one black dog and one gray dog. If I try and like picture these arguments that he's making, and if I try and just test the counter argument and say, no, actually black scopes over two dogs because if you say two black dogs, both of them have to be black. You can't, uh, black, black two dogs can't mean black refers to the dogs, but not to two of them or something like that. I find the arguments just incredibly abstract and kind of spacey. And when I try and think it through, it just seems to work either way you put it. Isn't that just an argument about how we can walk around ethics in English? Which is what I think as well. Yeah. I, I think that the intuitive, if there is an intuitive appeal to the argument and it went through the editors and recross books, so someone believed it, then I think it may just be it may be just actually based on the word order that makes it seem intuitive. I don't know. Again, so this is just some of the reasons why people believe there is a hierarchical structure, but I don't find them particularly convincing. So in the proposal we're working on, we don't think there's any kind of semantic scope hierarchy between these things. We see it as you've got dogs and then you've got three different modifiers. You know, one saying they're black, one saying there are two of them and Whatever, how do you want to get to the semantics of that? Let's say that they're proximal rather than distal or something like that. Okay. And, but we do kind of treat one of those elements as being like a semantic head to which the others are modifiers, but then no further kind of scope relations. Okay. So after all that, I will now get into what we're actually proposing. I hope that wasn't too long a preamble. We're proposing a model which a large part of it is based on the concept of interpredictability. So you might be asking, what is interpredictability and what has that got to do with grammatical structure? Well, there's a fantastic study of noun phrases and uh, interpredictability relations. And that's why we're doing noun phrases because it's an excellent study by Carl Whitson et al in language. And so they describe, so it's these noun phrase elements that we're looking at, nouns, adjectives, numbers, and demonstratives, I should say. And what they propose is that things, nouns and adjectives from the nature of your experiences in the world, nouns and adjectives tend to have high interpredictability. Whereas number and even less so demonstratives have less kind of intrinsic connection to the noun. And they argue it's because noun, uh, sorry, adjectives often denote the permanent properties of the nouns. So like Dalmatians are permanently spotted. So it's more predictable the way that this noun and adjective might co-occur. Whereas the numeracy of the, the number that, adject, that Dalmatians come in can freely change. And whether they're proximal or distal, these or those, this can just freely change from moment to moment. Whereas the spottedness is more like a permanent predictable property, right? So they say that due to our experiences of the world, nouns and adjectives tend to be more interpredictable. If you, when you see one, you have more capacity to predict what it's going to co-occur with, whereas numbers and demonstratives, very little interpredictability. And they test that on corpus data for like 24 languages, and it's pretty robust in these 24 languages anyway. Um, so this graph just shows you this. So this is measuring interpredictability using a fairly simple mathematical equation called mutual information. So higher mutual information is for variables that are highly predictive of each other. And so the, it's for every single language they measured, the adjectives 
have the highest interpredictability with the noun, and then always the numbers had less and the demonstratives had very, very little. And it's nice that the, the ranking worked out the same for every corpus. That was quite impressive. Uh, I, I do not remember. But yeah, good, good to point out that one of them is in fact a kitty. Is it carers to kitties or both? Ways? Yeah, carers and kitties. The rest are presumably mostly adult, adult language. Okay, so that's an interesting result. So we've got this consistent cross-linguistic pattern in the interpredictability relations within noun phrases. And then the other thing we've got cross-linguistically is a strong pattern in how they're in the linear sequencing of those elements. And the basics of the pattern is the adjective is generally the closest, at least equal closest to the noun. And the number is not closer than the adjective and the demonstrative is not closer than them. And so you can have the number and the adjective on either side of the noun, that still conforms to this, but you just can't have a demonstrative closer than the adjective, or you can't have a number closer than the adjective. It's this kind of proximity structure. And there's eight different specific orders that satisfy that, that proximity structure. And when you look at a few hundred languages of the world, the vast majority of them, actually it's not that vast, actually 83% of the languages, fit into this particular constraint. So now we've got a generalized cross-linguistic pattern in language use in the way that there's more interpredictability within the noun phrase, plus that matches a pattern in how those noun phrases have their linear sequencing. So this suggests that there's some strong, interesting connection between interpredictability and linear sequencing in noun phrases. So can we actually use that mutual information, that, interpredict, that interpredictability to explain these patterns. So, you know, they basically show there's a really strong connection. They don't go that much into like, how, do you, how did they get to be connected, right? What is the mechanism? So what we're essentially doing as our study is trying to develop a mechanism for it. And by the way, we argue that um, if you can develop a mechanism that goes straight essentially from interpredictability to the linear sequence, then you don't even, you have no need to try and argue for this underlying hierarchical structure. To us, it becomes pretty redundant at that point, especially since the reasons for it aren't that compelling to And just to note, we're not claiming that there's nothing hierarchical in syntax. Things like relative clauses and embedded sentences do seem pretty much hierarchical, but we're just saying that many elements of language, such as the internal structure of a noun phrase, seem to us to be can be explained as linear sequences rather than needing hierarchical structure. So I'll now step you through the model. Um, it's the thing runs on three pretty basic principles, which we think these three principles are independently like sound and there's, there's independent evidence for them. And we take them as working assumptions in our model, but we think they're reasonably convincing. So the first is that when humans process language, they store and retrieve complex symbols, by which we mean we don't just atomize everything into morphemes or words or whatever. We store complex symbols. I'll show you some examples. We also take as an assumption that if you store these complex symbols in your head, when you then produce a, a linguistic expression, you prefer to keep those complex symbols next next to each other in a, in a blob. You don't want them spread out over the sentence. And thirdly, that uh, you use linear sequences when you give a linguistic expression, and then you tend to reuse the same, the same structural sequences. And there's heaps of evidence for that. And we develop this as, a specific, as an explicit computational model, namely a Python script, basically. Um, so at the moment, we've got, when I'm saying we, uh, Basically, I've done a preliminary implementation and I'm now working with Charles Kemp to make a more um, sexy implementation on a better, on not that same computer that I just showed. <laughs> so how it works is, uh, why, one reason why it's preliminary is it starts, it works from toy data that I just put together. It's not even real corpus data yet, but I built the toy data in such a way that the main property of it is that it catches this mutual information pattern 
in the way that in the distribution of the nouns, adjectives, and demonstratives, etc. So I just made toy data that matches that kind of disjoint. And the model has um, messages that people store and transmit. And the messages, here's the fakest thing about it, is that every message consists of exactly a noun, an adjective, a number, and a demonstrative. It models human communication as always having to cover each of those semantic types. Now, I know that people don't really communicate like that, but this is like the simplest entry level to doing the model. And I don't believe that the model is particularly going to be held back by that. I think we should be able to move beyond that. So we store the, these are messages that we use, like dogs, brown, three of these, et cetera, right? You get that? Um, this shows their unordered sequences, right? This is like a set notation. They're just It's an unordered, sorry, an unordered set of, of uh, semantic signs, symbols. Now, like I said, we have storage of complex symbols. And what, what drives the storage is that mutual information. So uh, in the model, the, 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 the processor is exposed to you know, input of different messages, and it's able to calculate which, which semantic elements have higher mutual information. And let's say from the messages it's seen, it's found this high mutual information between cats and black. Then when it stores that message, it will have a higher probability of chunking these together into a complex symbol. So that's that complex symbol storage property that I talked about. And by the way, that's recursive, so it can also actually uh, make a complex symbol that's then part of a complex symbol. So that's not very important right now. So that's the mutual information it uses to do that. Now, yeah. Chonking rather than chonking. Yes, chonking, chonking the black cats. Um, now, just in case you were wondering about what is this storage of complex symbols, so there's heaps of research showing this, uh, uh, joined by this research on the phrase, I don't know, that gives nice evidence that people probably store it as a whole unit. Yeah, it's got like holistic properties, right? So that's one type. That's basically explained as like fre frequently repeated constructions. Uh, there's a fantastic book by Alison Ray. She talks about kind of all these fixed prefabricated things, like would you be so kind as to, very kind of British way of talking. You know, she, it, just, it doesn't seem plausible. That, this is actually quite a syntactically complex structure. It doesn't seem plausible that people are building that structure online every time. They presumably kind of chunk that. Uh, then you've got all your idioms, right? Your semantically opaque things, which is another form of evidence that people are storing these complex symbols in their head. That's the only claim we're depending on that they're storing complex symbols in their head. And I guess aligned with that, we have the claim that this interpredictability property is one of the main drivers of that kind of complex storage, complex symbol storage. And why we claim that, that goes into some efficient coding theory, which uh, is a little bit mind bending, but it's a bit like a zip file. Zip file basically takes all these symbols and tries to compress them and it takes kind of sequences and uses some kind of reference pointer mechanism to like store them as something shorter. And there are two principles you want to do when you do that. You want to do as many compressions and reductions as you can, but you don't want to do, you don't want to have too many different compressions and reductions because then the, the like the kind of mapping file that tells you how to undo them again ends up being longer than the actual data. That's the best I can explain it right now. So you've got to, your optimal solutions to this efficient coding are ones that balance out these properties. And my current understanding is that mutual information offers optimal solutions to the, the two properties. Certainly, all right, so I, I like the example of, right, so if you've got to store some, you've got all these words you're using, and if you've got to store some of them as complex symbols in your head, things like mash and potatoes, it's to do with the fact that you've got to balance out, it's not just the individual frequency of the elements, it's the fact that it's like they're more likely to occur together than they are to occur apart, especially the word mash, right? A lot of the times you would use the word mash, you're probably using it with potatoes. So it's going to be more efficient actually just to store them in some way, in some form, they're stored together. Um, so we kind of we actually tested that on our input data, and there's like an optimal frontier kind of thing where basically those two 
constraints where you want to shorten your messages, you want to get in this way, and you want to reduce how many different shortenings you use, and that's where you go down this way. And if we do it based on uh, mutual information, we get closer to that optimization. Whereas if we don't use mutual information, it's, it's worse off. Okay, so that's that part. So you've now got these complex symbols stored. Now you've got to transmit a message to someone. You've got to linearize it into speech or sign or whatnot. And here we have two principles. So it's a stochastic process, by the way. So there's inherent variation in the system. People can use different orderings when they speak, which is real, which is true. People do that. Um, and the first principle, which I mentioned already, is that if you've stored cats in black as a complex symbol, you want them to be next to each other in your string. You don't want them to be separated out. So we take that as a fundamental principle. There's higher probability assigned to contiguity of complex symbols. Now, why didn't we just make that uh, unviable? Because it's just higher probability. But actually, the interesting thing about symbols in human language is we do sometimes break them up. Things like fan fucking fantastic. Presumably, you store fantastic as a sing as a as a symbol, but you can put something in the middle as well. Okay, but you you know, generally, it looks like things that are stored as symbols get output in a contiguous manner. <clears throat> then the other, this is the fast, the last principle is that we reuse the same orders again and again, okay? So if on our previous iteration, we chose this order and we chose it because of the contiguity, we're like those black cats too, then our next expression we utter, if we're using, we might be using some different symbols now, but we're gonna match the same grammatical sequence. So we might say these white walls, white wheels form or something, because it matches the same grammatical sequence. And I chose that example because wheels and four is a potential example where sometimes the number and the noun may actually have very high mutual information. And maybe four and wheels, I think four and wheels could potentially be stored as a complex symbol. But you want to match the same categorical sequencing so uh, you, you, you follow what was done with that. And what that explains is how Individual symbols have their own mutual information properties, but it's the fact that overall, on average, the adjectives and the nouns have, on average, more mutual information means that you get a relatively consistent grammatical ordering rather than just specific orderings for whatever symbols you're using at the time. Does that make sense? That's how we end up with like consistent grammatical schemas at all because we're copying the same grammatical sequences again and again. And there's heaps of evidence from that in structural priming. So that's where they, they run experiments to see whether people copy the same syntactic structures off each other and they do constantly. Okay, so the results of the, the very preliminary model are quite nice. So here's like 20 iterations of running the whole kind of system on this toy data. And basically I just start the, so, and testing the orderings that it chooses just based on those very a priori, based, based on those very plausible principles, are those orderings the same as what we see in natural languages of the world? And in these 20 iterations, 17 out of 20 of them are. They're the, the kinds of orderings that natural languages also use. Um, Dreyer's study, so by the way, when I say those kinds of orderings that natural languages use, not every natural language does, but like 83% of them in Dreyer's study prefer the same orderings as what our, what our model does. And this is probably, probably too much detail, but basically there are, there are coherent. So those parameters that I talked about, like the contiguity and the reuse of the same orders, you can change how strong the parameters are. That's what you do when you make it a computational model. You know, you can kind of vary your parameters and see, see what's important. Basically, there's a coherent area where the parameters come together and interact to create natural language-like orders. I call it the sweet region. And I just want to repeat last point that I really like that the model has that inherent variability in it because I did a, I did a search on the internet to test this because I, I kept thinking about four wheels was the best example I could think of. Of I try to think, all right, what are the times when a number and a noun would have high interpredictability? I thought, all right, four wheels. So I just tested it and I immediately found, so you're supposed to say uh, number, adjective, noun, four impressive wheels, but 
I immediately found an example saying impressive four wheels, which speculatively could be because in that person's linguistic cognition, four and wheels are somehow kind of connected as some form of complex symbol. That's the end of the story. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought it was long enough. So in, in summary, um, these are our main principles which we've implemented in a computational like model of a language mechanism. And the basic symbols again are just that we have storage and retrieval of complex symbols. It's driven by mutual information. When we transmit a message, we like those complex symbols to be contiguous. So it's not inviolable. Sometimes they do get broken apart. And finally, we reuse the same grammatical orders again and again. And that means you end up with convergence to a particular grammatical order rather than just having totally unconstrained variability. And we think that, well, if you can produce natural language like output with those principles, all of which have good independent evidence, then that's the same redundant. If you can get the desired output without any underlying hierarchy, why, why propose it anyway, especially if the evidence for it was rather shaky? There's still heaps of limitations. So I want to emphasize just a completely preliminary implementation. The worst parts about it are well, that it's toy data rather than real corpus data. The rigid message structure is very unlike real language. That, that way that you have to choose one from each semantic class when you communicate, that's pretty weird. Um, we didn't get, we didn't even get into morphological agreement yet. I haven't even thought about how to do that. And also it's really unlike actual human language because actual human language is various, uh, you know, individuals who interact and get input from each other. And our model has none of that. It's just like a single lone entity speaking into the void, which is maybe how we feel anyway. Plus we haven't even compared it to like, you know, does our model do better in some way than Hawkins' proposal or someone else's? So that, that's it. That's the talk. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now while we take um, questions. So I'll open the floor to questions, uh, either in person or online. <laughs>